Good. It is afternoon officially. If everyone could find their seats, we're going to get started. Hello and welcome everybody to the 2022-2023 Fairbanks Lecture Series in Clinical Ethics. My name is Brian Leland and I direct the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics and our Clinical Ethics Fellowship here. Um, thank you for your continued patience and understanding as we navigate our new CME and CE process. Um, the text code for CME and CE is on the screen currently um, and use that to receive credit for attending today's lecture. Uh, certificates are now being sent out approximately 30 days after each lecture. Um, also, please mark your calendars for the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics Conference and Clinical Ethics, which will take place on Friday, February 3rd, 2023, in Hine Hall, which is on IEPUI's uh, campus proper. Um, you can also visit our website at www.fairbankscenter.org for more information. Um, we plan for registration to open up in the next week or two, so please keep uh, your eye out for that. Uh, a couple preliminaries for our lecture today. Uh, this web webinar is being recorded. It will be available on our website, which again is at fairbankscenter.org within the next week. We encourage you to send, <coughs> pardon me, your colleagues uh, to the website for uh, viewing that as well. Uh, for those watching via Zoom, the Q&A box is available to post questions. Uh, however, we will not be responding to those questions until the end of the presentation, um, so you will need to be patient with us. Uh, Mr. Armstrong has no relevant financial conflicts of interest to disclose. Uh, I am now pleased to introduce our speaker, Kevin R. Armstrong, a Washington, Indiana native who graduated from DePaul University uh, in the very recent past, as I understand it. Uh, Unable to decide between law school and seminary, he attended both. He graduated from Duke University and also in the very recent past. Following graduation from Duke, uh, Kevin served as an associate chaplain at DePaul and then pastored um, three different United Methodist congregations here in Indianapolis. In March 2012, Kevin became president of the Methodist Health, Health Foundation, the organization of philanthropic support for Indiana University Health Methodist and University Hospitals here in Indianapolis. He was named IU Health's Chief Mission um, and Values Officer in January of 2016, and a year later was appointed IU Health Chief of Staff and Executive Vice President. Kevin has written and taught for religious, civic, and government audiences authored and co-authored numerous books <clears throat> and articles for academic and public audiences and directed an 11 part PBS series called Faith and Community, The Public Role of Religion. Kevin will be retiring from IU Health at the end of 2022 and looks forward to more time with friends and family, exploring the world and improving his skills in running, writing and photography. Um, I want to say that uh, we will miss him dearly here at the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics and the Department of Clinical and Organizational Ethics. The landscape of uh, clinical ethics for IU Health will be forever changed because of his leadership, um, and the future is the brightest it has ever been because of him. It is now my privilege to introduce Kevin Armstrong to talk with us about everyday ethics. Hi, everybody. How many cho choices have you made so far today? When to get up, whether to hit the snooze button, what to wear, how to squeeze in some exercise, where to hide that extra Halloween candy so you don't eat it all at once, whether to hit the snooze button the second time. How many decisions do you think you'll make by the time you fall asleep tonight? This is a serious question. I'm asking those of you in the audience, shout it out. How many decisions do you think you'll make today? 430. Oh, come on folks. One dollar, Bob. Uh, researchers at Cornell University estimate we'll make 226 decisions each day just on food. And as your level of responsibility increases, so does the multitude of choices you have to make. 
it's estimated that the average adult, and you're all above average, makes 35,000 remotely conscious decisions each day, each decision carrying benefits and consequences. Now, frankly, I find that number really hard to believe. Assuming that you get eight hours of sleep tonight, and I'm hoping at least two of you did today, that leaves 57,600 seconds to make 35,000 decisions or about 1.5 decisions per second. Really? No, I'm serious. It has to be true. Why? Because I found a citation on the internet that said so. <laughs> a further bit of research review may indicate the number is potentially closer to something like uh, a whole bunch. When I retire at the end of this year, I'll leave with a grateful heart for at least three things. The friendships and the relationships I've enjoyed here, appreciation for the sense of purpose and commitment that are on display every day in our clinical areas and quietly behind the scenes among the thousands of people who support our clinicians. And nothing short of awe at the quantity and quality of decisions that are made by you and by our team members every single day. Some of these decisions have existential implications to be sure. Others are perhaps much more mundane. For instance, I think about the first day of incident command at the system level, March 9th, 2019, when we naively gathered 20 people in a small, poorly ventilated conference room elbow to elbow without masks and ask, we know what our values are. Now, how do we commit to specific principles to guide us through whatever lies ahead? Very quickly, we decided that there were four, mitigate the spread of COVID, enable our workforce to practice safely, be good stewards of our scarce resources, and be a trusted source of information. In other words, at that table and throughout the state, how do we move into an unknown future guided by what is ethically right, not just legally required? Or how about decisions related to policies? I truly believe that most policies are instituted by well-meaning people seeking to do good for the greatest number of people. Policies that include state or federally mandated guidelines, institutional policies about tolerance of patient and family behavior, or HR policies about your time off or dress or pay or benefits. And most of these policies have been designed based on our values, our industry standards, the strategy, regulatory requirements, and yet most weeks, those of you who are in leadership positions encounter the exception, the outlier, the reasonable objection. How can a decision which looks so clear on paper look so confusing in the context of it involving a friend, a colleague, or yourself? Or how about the hundreds of times that you and I have met with someone behind a closed door or in a quiet corner or over a cup of coffee who's faced with a unique or difficult or confusing moment that seems to have no obvious answer. In trying to come with what the friend describes as the right decision, you and I are put into the position to decide how and when do we participate in helping someone who's trying to sort out choices without being criticized or compromised. Every day, at work, at home, among our family and friends, among the strangers we briefly encounter, our lives bump up against decisions. Some momentous, some monotonous, many will be forgotten by the end of the day, and a few will live, long, will live with us for as long as we have memory. And yet all the choices matter because thread together, they begin to reveal a pattern about who we are and the contribution we will make to those around us and to the larger world. 
Our decisions are often informed by our growing up experiences and fused with what we learned inside and outside the classroom or the clinic. And they often mirror what leaders and mentors have taught us by their words or actions or inactions. So how do we weave the threads into something that may never be seamless, but at least begins to provide consistency? to the character and capabilities of our life. I can only begin to hint at the direction of that task, but today I'd like to offer three thoughts that may prompt your own ideas and answers to that question. First, I wanna pay tribute to our friends at the Department of Ethics and the Fairbank Center for Medical Ethics for how in the past 18 years of their existence, they have offered all of us who are willing to participate a framework for medical and organizational ethical decision-making, a framework that's not limited to your shift or to your studies. Second, I wanna reflect with you about how apart from their standard rubrics for thinking and behaving ethically, I believe that our ethics-minded friends have contributed an equally powerful, if perhaps, more subtle gift about narrative that can inform all of us in our day-to-day -day living and decision-making. And finally, I wanna invite you to consider where in your daily life that there is greater opportunity for everyday ethics or to paraphrase our friend, Amy Martin, how we can live as if there are no ethics-free zones in your life and work. Now, I suspect most of you in this room or listening remotely probably already know something about the beginning of the Department of Ethics, but a brief primer never hurts to remind us of our roots. As Alex Haley tried to teach my generation 50 years ago, understanding our heritage often produces a yearning for a brighter future. In 1999, the Richard M. Fairbanks Foundation approached the CEO of Clarion Health then the predecessor to IU Health about the possibility of a living memorial to grandfather Charles Warren Fairbanks. If you're a Hoosier, you learned in the fourth grade that Charles Warren Fairbanks was a US Senator for two terms. He became a vice president to Teddy Roosevelt and either he or Vice President John Garner are the ones who came up with the phrase that the vice presidency is not worth a bucket of spit. And he didn't say spit. So we'll add to his virtues candor. The Honorable Charles Warren Fairbanks, however, was also a great friend of this institution that you all in this auditorium are sitting in. He served on the board and was president of the Meth of Methodist Hospital. Uh, he was a great contributor and a generous patron, and he spoke at the laying of the cornerstone here. Well, as often happens in the grant-making world, the leaders of Clarion Health approached the Fairbanks Foundation with four options that they asked us to present so that they could begin to help us decide which one to focus on. And as sometimes happens, they returned with the fourth of what we thought were the possibilities for establishment of a center as a living memorial to his legacy and to the people of Indiana. From that grant, my predecessor, Steve Ivey, helped design what Dr. Paul Helf launched and piloted. Those of you who know Paul know that he brought with him a depth of wisdom and experience from his time at the McLean Center at University of Chicago. But more importantly, Paul embodied both knowledge and wisdom about the task at hand. Among all the choices that the members of the hiring committee made that day, choosing Paul as the founding director has to be among the best of their choices. During the first few years of the activity of the FCME, they began to lay the foundation for programs that were offered support through ethics consultations, programs for students and clinicians, Dr. Health and a growing number of members of the IU Health Ethics community created first important programs, such as the Fairbanks Fellowship in Clinical Ethics and the Fairbanks Program in Nursing Ethics. One of the assumptions about the ethics consultation program and fellowship was and is that having trained team members embedded throughout the system 
would create a network of accessible and approachable colleagues who would guide ethical decision-making within a unit or a department. Or in other words, the team recognized an almost universal truth when confronted with a challenge, we're much more likely to phone a friend than page a stranger. Well, the Department of Ethics is now led by Dr. Amy Martin. One of these looks unlike all the others. And Amy and her team have been able to expand the support and the education and the research mission across our system today. More than 100 fellows, hundreds of publications and presentations, this lecture series creating internships for graduate students, the staff and faculty have created a vital local resource and a national reputation. To paraphrase my grandmother, when one of her grandchildren was recognized for an accomplishment, well, I always knew all along that you were great, but it's good that other people have figured that out as well. The pandemic has had the effect of increasing the ethics department's visibility, expanding awareness and confidence in their and your work. And so under the label of no good deed goes unpunished, Amy and her team have accepted an even greater volume of work ranging from more complex medical consultations, engagement with our legal and governmental team, organizational matters, clinical matters, and a statewide leadership through the Patient Safety Coalition and other entities. Let me just summarize my gratitude and my tribute to this group this way. The Department of Ethics and the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics serve as the Shane Battier of our larger team. Remember Shane, you do caters, go ahead and get it out of your system. I expected a few boos along the way. So, Shane also played for the Miami Heat and Memphis and Houston. And he was often overlooked, sometimes dismissed, but as data, data analytics got more sophisticated as it did in baseball, people began to see Shane in a new way. When he was on the court, his teammates got better, a lot better. He may not grab huge numbers of rebounds, but he had an uncanny ability to improve his teammates rebounding. He didn't shoot much, but when he did, he took off in the most efficient shots. He also had a knack for getting the ball to teammates who were in a position to do the same, and he committed very few turnovers. Daryl Morey used to call Shane Lego, because when he's on the court, all the pieces start to fit together. There are many individuals and departments at IU Health whose contributions are hidden, even overlooked, but I don't wanna leave this wonderful role at the end of the year without publicly acknowledging and saying thanks to the staff and faculty and all of you who have been participants in the Department of Ethics and FCME. I am grateful to you. And I believe that indeed your best is in front of you. Now I have also observed over the last several years, a more subtle practice of medical and organizational ethics that might serve all of us, not just at work, but in your personal and family and community lives. And that's the way that ethicists are trained to think with stories and not just about stories. It's a subtle but important distinction. And I hope I can articulate it clearly enough. Medicine and healthcare have never been easy, but since the pandemic, healthcare often seems like an emotional and moral contact sport. As emergency room physician Jay Baruch says, providers across healthcare wrestle with less time with more patients while staring glassy eyed at the computer screen. Sound familiar? Over time, we may be able to solve for staff ratios, span of control, EMR frustrations, but addressing these real but tactical frustrations will not in themselves solve for what I believe is our greatest challenge, understanding with stories. Very often the muddled first drafts that present themselves to us in nearly every room of the hospital from the bedside to the boardroom. What ethicists encourage us to seek, 
listen, and live with are the often messy narratives of our patients, their families, their caregivers, and let's face it, the messy narratives of our own life. I would wager that for every ethics consultation that is requested, there are at least another hundred or so team members, patients, or family members who are trying not just to describe what is going on in front of them, but they're trying to understand it. Thinking with stories in this instance is different than thinking about them. Now, I'm one of those people who believe storytelling is an essential leadership tool, but taken as an extreme, stories can be reduced to pornography. That is to say, the subject becomes the object. And stories that are objectified and reduced to simply prove an, an already given assumption, or worse, an exaggeration, have the potential to do great harm. The ethicist invites us to create the space to listen deeply to one another so we can explore the untidy relationships and details of living that are a prerequisite for shaping generative decisions. What do we really know about this person's desires, the family needs, the team's hope or distress, the situation in the context of so many other similar and sometimes competing demands? The willingness to create time and space amidst competing interests, overburdened schedules, preconceived theories, unchallenged assumptions, goes to the roots of our being, revealing the patterns that make us who we are today. Before the ethicist tells a story of a patient or family member, she and those with whom she is consulting must find the heart of the patient's story. There are cho choices to be made, but not without living with and alongside the narrative. How often have we been rushed to decisions about which medical technology to employ, what protocols are appropriate or not, or how to prioritize the competing claims of resource allocation? But the best technology and protocols and principles are of little use if we get the story wrong. Our urge to act in the patient or family's best interests begins with understanding the inner experience of the other. In his book, A Fortunate Man, which is a portrait of a country doctor in rural England, John Berger writes, landscapes can be so deceptive. Sometimes a landscape seems to be less a setting for the life of its inhabitants than a curtain behind which their struggles, achievements, and accidents take place. I love that we are encouraged to ask all our patients, what matters most to you today? Because it offers the opportunity to pull back the curtain of what we have learned on an intake form or in the EMR about the landscape of our patient's life. Our patients and their families come to us for medical knowledge, expertise, innovative technology, but also for recognition, dignity, and compassion. And not just for our patients, but our colleagues, our neighbors, maybe even our family members and friends. All of this is swell, you say. I'd like to have more time for space, for my patient's story, my colleague's story, heck, for my own darn story. But how? It will take a movement. Or as we more politely say in healthcare, a change in our care model design. None of you at the bedside or in the office or moving down the halls can pull back the curtain and explore every story. But I suspect we have not tapped into the potential of our 38,000 member experience. Several years ago, I was rounding at one of our regional hospitals and I saw one of our EVS workers wiping a tear off his cheek as he left the patient's room. I waited a few minutes and then when no one else was around, struck up a conversation. He told me the patient in the room he was cleaning was having a hard day. Her husband died exactly a year ago that day. He described a person for whom grief had been a constant companion, but that day was exceptionally brutal. 
Our EVS worker was moved as he listened to her grief. They had prayed together and he described his tears as part sadness for her loneliness and part gratitude that he felt like he had made a difference in her life by listening. I asked if he thought anyone else on the floor knew what that day meant to the woman in 206. Oh no, he said, I don't think so. She said, they're all so busy here. I don't want to burden them. Well, I said, it's up to you. I don't want you to break any confidences, but you're a part of the care team too. And I bet her nurse would like to know. I don't know what happened after that. Maybe nothing. Maybe nothing else was needed. Compassion is often speechless. But I will never forget that EVS worker entering the messy draft of that woman's story and allowing himself to identify with and be moved by someone who was suffering. Doctors, nurses, technicians, therapists, EVS workers, chaplains, social workers, food and nutrition team members, transporters, there are so many members of our care team. The competing demands of our workforce cause many of us to have to allocate compassion. I get it. We don't often talk about compassion as a justice issue, but I believe that it may be. And becoming more just ought not to be a new job requirement or an ELMS module. Become, becoming more just may require us to think about who we are and who we regard as a part of our care team. Who's a part of the care team where you work? The ones who learn and serve with stories, not just by telling them. Whose care team are you part of at work, at home, or in the community? Have we inadvertently marginalized people who can help us imagine new models of care as we think with all the stories that move through these halls and in our streets. Please don't understand me. Stories can be tools of deception as well as instruments of compassion. And compassion can be confusing as well as fatiguing. But the discipline and rigor of learning and teaching with stories often help mitigate the risk that I believe we must take. So where does this take us in terms of your everyday decisions and how they shape your life and the lives of those around you? Let me reiterate a shameless plug. Stay in touch with FCME and the Department of Ethics. The work they do in our larger system and community can guide and inform us at home and in the community, not just at work. They have a way of thinking that's disciplined, but flexible, time-tested, and yet contemporary. Make a path to their consultations, to their workshops, to their presentations, and once you arrive, get engaged. Let them hear your voice as you hear theirs. But let me focus specifically on their gift of thinking with and not just about stories as it relates to those plus or minus 35,000 decisions you may make today. I'm biased toward the idea that examining one's life is a good thing, but examining one's life gets pretty boring and pretty self-centered quickly without asking, what am I discovering? Which typically leads to that ancient question, what ought I do? which is foundational, at least in the West, to this thing we call ethics. The wonderful question, what ought I do, has both a broad application and a practical focus. It's not a question reserved for lofty matters of war and peace, euthanasia and capital punishment, marriage and divorce, but also for the ordinary questions of life. Dress codes, jokes we hear, internet dating, splitting the tab, what I'm, I mean, what you're going to tell your mother when she asks how much you like that hideous sweater that she gave you for Christmas. Here's a list of some of the everyday ethics issues that I compiled from asking other people. Conversations with friends, I bet you have dozens more. Choose two or three. And if you're really brave, invite some others to listen to your story and tell their own story about one of these issues, and then do what good ethicists do so well. Get curious, 
or as my Castilian friend says, and I hear her voice every time I say the word, be curious. Rather than seeking answers, find the right questions. What do you learn as you live with these stories about yourself, about your values, about your point of view, your yearnings and your frustrations? Why does this story matter more to you than others? What values are evident? What principles emerge? Good ethicists develop a muscle memory over time, guided by the discipline of framing questions based on values and principles, while acknowledging that these principles are often competing and eventually must be prioritized. Story is an essential companion. Or to mix my metaphors, a story is a house with many rooms, and we learn with stories rather than simply tell them we begin to better understand ourselves and those with whom we share these many homes. I may be totally wrong about all of this, but here's what I think I have right. We live in a culture that's enamored with fame, power, and authority. We name buildings and highways and clinics after people who are known for big decisions and outsized contributions. And that's fitting and appropriate. I suspect, however, if most of us examine our life, we will recognize we have been primarily shaped and influenced, encouraged and emboldened by rather ordinary people who entered into our messy narratives and helped us think and learn and behave more purposefully, more compassionately, and perhaps more wisely by the way their disciplined curiosity and engagement pulled back the curtain on who we are and who we want to be. Intentionality and discipline and decision-making of the order our ethicist friends offer is one path for contributing in ordinary and in extraordinary ways to those around us and the greater enterprise of healthcare and the communities where we live and work. So I invite you to explore the difference, if indeed there is one, between thinking with stories and thinking about them. Try it with your everyday decisions, as well as your clinical or administrative responsibilities. Be curious. Consider narratives an invitation to discovery and not simply a lesson in problem solving. Build those narrative muscles in such a way that gives your life purpose and discipline while also allowing you to become that person others seek for comfort and challenge or counsel. And have fun building those muscles. What makes our work difficult can be very different from what makes it profoundly hard and profoundly meaningful. With friends and colleagues, Use this list, make your own. Discover the joy of seemingly simple decisions often leading to the most meaningful insights about our identity and purpose, which serve us well when the so-called big decisions come along. I'm grateful for the chance to be with you today. And I wanna welcome your thoughts and critique and engagement I'm profoundly thankful for the leadership, compassion, and commitment that every one of you in this room provides our patients and families and one another. And I leave confidently that the best we are to be as individuals and as an institution remains unseen, but will likely be viewed in retrospect as the accumulation of thousands of everyday decisions that you are making. Thank you. Thoughts, comments, critique, suggestions. What the heck did he just say?
Do you think that there is a difference between living with stories and talking about stories? What's it look like for you? It's okay, you can look at me. You don't have to look down, even if you don't have a thought. Um, I think living with stories is much more personal. It pulls you into the story more and helps you be more invested in it so that if you see it in the future or if it occurs to you, you you relay it better or you can help that person more or, or have somebody help you more if you live somebody else's story and live with them. Yeah, it requires an openness, doesn't it? That's hard to do in a taxing world. Um, do, do you know the uh, Chekhov short story, uh, Misery? Uh, uh, Iona, the sledge driver, think of him as the uh, 19th century Russian Uber driver. Uh, was his, his son has died, Isn't that right? And as he picks up his customers, he tries to tell them about his grief and none of them want to hear it. And he ends up going back to the barn and telling his pony. It requires an openness, I think, to, to learn with, to listen with, to not simply learn from or tell that story. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin Armstrong. Um, I'm Anastasia Holman and living with the story, it connects for me with compassion as justice. And so being with a person as was stated versus living stories living about or around us. So it puts me as a third person. So I really like that piece about justice, compassion as justice. It kind of clicked for me uh, on those busy days that I may not be fully listening to the story. How am I avoiding compassion and then also justice? So thank you for that. Yeah, and I hope that you don't hear that as um, run faster, do more. That's not it at all. Uh, for me, it's really about how are all of us in this web together? Uh, and just as justice means there's enough bread to go around, uh, I think it can also mean there's enough compassion to go around. Yeah, Jane. Oh. Hold on, before we get to Jane's question, I have a question online about what it, about compassion fatigue. What are your thoughts around comp compassion fatigue? It's real, isn't it? But you know what? I think what I experience more than compassion fatigue is compassion confusion. Uh, that, that is to say, what's the right thing to do here? Uh, what, what's going on here? And that's where living with the story becomes really important. Uh, if we answered every call to compassion, fatigue is bound to be uh, our neighbor, if not our bedmate. Uh, but I think a first step to avoiding that uh, is, is to ask ourselves, what confuses me most about compassion? What's at work in those settings where I find myself most conflicted about what to do? Jen? Um, I hope this ends up being well formulated enough. Um, but I guess my, what I'd like to ask you to comment a little bit more on um, is so when Rita Sharon talks about um, thinking with stories, what she's getting at there is this idea that there's a, um, a cooperative involved in that process. That when you think about stories, and this is, gets back to the Chekhov story, right? That you can stand on the outside looking in, but particularly in medicine, you're actually part of the story, even as you're receiving it and speaking back to the patient. And so I guess I'm just wondering, I mean, that's obviously a, a sort of intensely narrative medicine, narrative ethics technique. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about how you see that um, kind of informing or potentially informing the practice of our clinicians. I'd like to hear you talk about it first. <laughs> well, I'll, so I'll say this just um, on 
for as a matter of um, both compassion fatigue and as the wife of a primary care physician, uh, that one of the things people need to have in order to truly engage in that narrative process, um, thinking with stories, is more time. And the pressures of sort of big business medicine make that really nearly impossible. So when we think about incorporating that, um, there has to be the possibility to, you know, as we kind of say in ethics, you know, that which is not feasible is not ethically obligatory. And it's not presently feasible to engage in the kind of exchange with patients that allows for narrative medicine or narrative ethics to truly sort of take place for the physician to be truly present in that exchange of information, in that exchange of story. Yeah, I, I think one of the questions that I have, Jane, is, is there a different care model that we have not yet explored that, that actually creates time and space because there's no question that so many of you who are at the bedside uh, are working with ratios or uh, within the time constraints that makes it difficult for you to be present in the way that I know you really want to be. Um, I think through our congregational care network, through our community health community workers, uh, we're, we're beginning to glimpse what what does narrative medicine look like in those situations? And is there something we can learn from that inside the house as well as outside the house? Um, but, but I agree with you, the model isn't working. And so rather than stopping at the identification of the problem, what would it mean to raise some of these questions and to begin that movement? in some department, some clinic, some area to learn from our friends in community health and congregational care of what that looks like. So Kevin, I have two online. One of them, it kind of, I feel like ties into that pretty well is um, understanding with stories. Isn't that vulnerability? Great education and thank you. Yes, it is, isn't it? Um, boy, if we had enough time, Every one of us could go around this room and talk about what it was like to be vulnerable enough to live with the story of someone else. And it may have not been a profound moment for the other. It may have. It may be something the other has forgotten or not. But it's a moment that shaped us. And at least my experience has been as a pretty uptight old guy, vulnerability is hard, but not being vulnerable is even more difficult. And, and to live within the gift that that vulnerability can bring is something I hope we can encourage among ourselves and with others, because there, I know, are so many of you in this room who are good at that. Great, thank you. I have one more online and then we're gonna go over to, to Jay. This notion of thousands of everyday decisions and the acclamation of thousands of everyday decisions seems important from an organizational history perspective. Would you agree that an organization that leads with its values and has a long history of leaving with its values is also one that has encouraged the intentional exercise of ethics for all people at all levels more often than it has not? I think I'm gonna to disagree with that. that. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful statement. Um, and, you know, let, let's just talk about this building that we're in, um, a hospital that's uh, been around since 1905. And the, the moments in our history that people remember are very often the moments that we have been institutionally vulnerable and said, we made a mistake. Or the moments when as a department or a clinic, we've said, we have to live differently. These aren't our values. Um, and again, I, I would not disagree at all. I think those values are in the DNA, but I also think that folks like our department and FCME um, 
help amplify that and help spread that learning in ways that are very important to our future. Jay? Hi, Kevin, uh, Jay Foster here. A little, little bit closer with the mic. Thank you. A wonderful presentation. I appreciated also talking about the dangers of thinking with stories or, and, that, and that there's the possibility of using stories in a way that's coercive, manipulative, difficult. Um, and I just wanted if you to speak more about that in, in the current context. Uh, it's not a very well thought out question, but I just think that's so important to elaborate that here's this wonderful tool and like any tool, it can be misused. Yeah, stories, the, sometimes I believe the worst stories are the stories which insist on answering a question without even asking the question. So here, here's my uh, pastor's joke to associate with that. Forgive me. I, I loathe children's sermons. I just think they're ter terribly manipulative and exploitive if not done well, but pastor's giving a children's sermon and says, I'm thinking of something that's brown and has a long furry tail and eats nuts. And the little girl raises her hand and says, well, it sure sounds like a squirrel, but I bet the answer's Jesus. <laughs> that there are times that we use stories um, to prove a point that hasn't been yet explored, uh, to undergird an, an assumption that has not yet been tested, or to force a decision that isn't ready to be resolved. And I think, again, that word curious has got to be at the center of every leader. Again, to Jane's point, uh, sometimes we don't have time. If the house is on fire, you're not going to ask, is it ethically permissible to run in and put that fire out? Um, but I think as leaders, we need to explore with our teams the questions behind uh, the stories that come to us so that answers don't become pat. I'll, I'll give you one other example. In the executive team for the system, several years ago, we started beginning every executive team meeting with telling value stories. Bring to the table a way in which you think you have seen the values at work or at not. Um, when we first started those telling, telling those stories, th th those were good stories. We met our values. Then we started getting a little more vulnerable and saying, here's why I think we may have missed the mark. And then we did what good ethicists would encourage us to do. We started asking, how were these values prioritized in this particular situation? And what do we learn from that? So uh, yes, the, the stories can be tools of, of deception and aggrandizement and coercion, but they can also be uh, the pathway forward. Nicole? Hello, everyone. Nicole Wilson, Vice President of Community Health Operations. First of all, congratulations on your retirement and thank you for the inspiration you've been to many. This was a great lecture. Um, wondering if you could provide insight um, for those who are watching, those who are leaders, those who manage teams, um, when organizations such as ours have to make tough decisions. And sometimes that's layoffs. We haven't had to do that at IU Health, but structural things or things moving from here to there and all those types of things. Um, how um, you advise leaders to do that um, and help staff understand, because um, sometimes they will say, oh, if we were a values organization, then we wouldn't be doing X, Y, Z. <laughs> and so how do you grapple that? Um, with folks, um, because it may be very impactful to um, a certain group of people, um, but, and their lens may be from a different lens with which those decisions were made. Uh, just a couple of thoughts and others may wanna add to it. First of all, the, the necessity of transparency. Um, there, there's no place for sugarcoating. There's no place for saying, mm, maybe kind of sort of, uh, it, it's got to be honest if you're going to be trusted as a leader, because as soon as you lack that transparency and, and 
fail uh, to share the essence of what you know uh, is at stake, you've lost the trust uh, of your team. And uh, you know, as the old saying goes, the, the speed of trust uh, works fast in both directions. Second is as a leader, uh, you are likely in a position to see a larger landscape. And if you're not, you need to put yourself in a position where you can. This is what this decision could mean for our team. What does it also mean for the larger organization as measured by our strategy, our values, our operational goals, and any regulatory constraints that we're operating under. For me, that, that's the, the four box uh, that I use in those kinds of conversations. Let's get clear, what are, what are the values? What's the strategy that we say we're aiming toward? You may have the best idea in the world, but as an organization, we've said, that's not our direction right now. Uh, maybe it will be in the future, maybe not. And we have operational goals, which should never be ends in themselves, but should be pointing us in a direction that we all have clarity. What do we believe are the measurements of a great organization at this particular time? And then in the background, there are always regulatory requirements. And um, you, you may be the only one on your team in a position to say, I know that sucks, but um, this, this is the federal policy or this is the state policy. Would you add anything to that, Nicole? All health systems are having to make hard decisions right now um, just due to budget and where we're at with staffing. And so I think the more thoughtful we are about thinking that through and the message downstream as we make those decisions, the better we are because it'll probably get a little bit tougher moving forward. <laughs> Okay, I have two online. I'm kind of going to go right from one to the other because the first one's kind of a statement and I feel like it leads really well into the second one. Going back to the narrative, um, you know, it's also a matter of courage to live within the narrative. If one asks a question, one must be willing and able to hear the response, not necessarily to fix the problem, but to witness and be present. So the second one, do you feel like societal stigmas of different types of stories, examples such as addiction, abortions, et cetera, impact patients and even employees' ability to fully embrace and share the stories? And how do we go about navigating that in order for individuals to feel comfortable being vulnerable and sharing their stories? How much time do we have for the second one? Uh, to, to the, Seven minutes. To, <laughs> yeah, I love the first statement. Um, absolutely, the, um, the, the courage uh, to sit and listen uh, after you've asked a question is just as important as having the right question to ask. Um, and that takes remarkable leadership maturity to be able to do that because sometimes you hear an answer that makes you wanna run out the door, um, but that's not what good leaders do. Um, I don't know if I will get exactly at the question uh, that's been asked, but we're an organization that serves 3 million people a year. That's half the population of the state of Indiana. We're an organization of 38,000 people who represent the cross-section of Indiana in all the places where we serve. We are bound to have very different opinions uh, very different understandings of policy and decisions. And the, I think we at times embody what the larger society does, which is we stay within our own echo chambers. And I think the very best leaders are open to stories that may differ from their own that point in directions much different than where they're willing to go. And that doesn't mean uh, uh, one acquiesces, but it does mean, I think, 
that even in the short term, when we're talking with patients, the question becomes, what's my highest purpose here? Um, there are times when we are not called to debate um, an opinion uh, over an issue, but there may be times within our team that if we don't have the conversation, if we don't explore the narrative, uh, we will erode uh, the trust and the possibility of those teams. And so the questions about higher purpose uh, and about timing and about the, the many venues that, that we have for these controversial and I'm afraid growing controversial issues. Um, sidebar, I'm very concerned about our democracy uh, and what's at stake. And I think the only way to address that uh, is when uh, good people listen clearly, uh, take a stand and are willing to offer uh, enough grace to at least be alongside people that they would much prefer uh, uh, to abandon. And my codicil of that is I'm always going to be one of those people somebody wants to abandon. So it runs both ways. Thank you. Anybody else have anything in person? Hmm? Okay. If you are in person and have not signed in, please come sign in on our sheet. Kevin, thank you so much for your leadership to IU Health. Um, we wish you the best as you finish out your last two months and go on to retirement. Thank you very much. It's been great being with you this morning. This afternoon. <laughs>